in their life, you know, but un, un able to control their arms, hemibolismus of the arms. If what want, is it? Hemi, uh, hunting disease, it's a deterioration of the parts of the brain that control motor function. The parts of the brain that control motor function have two main pathways. One is a go pathway, like reach for this coffee mug, and the other one is a no-go pathway, resisting movement. And the no-go pathway degenerates substantially, other things too, and people with Huntington's chorea end up with these writhing ballistic movements, oh, and it's wow. an inherited disease, so you know what gene. It's the Huntington gene. And if you can, if you know that your, for instance, parent has it, you can get tested for it. A lot of people don't want to get tested. They don't want the answer because it's late onset. So you can be normal a certain portion of your life and then get it. It's a tragic disease. But if you test positive for this gene, you know you're going to get Huntington's. In well, which case, with CRISPR, you could just put the gene back in and rescue function. What causes someone to eventually succumb to that disease? If it's a late onset disease, if they don't have it when they're young and they develop when they get older, what changes? Yeah, so it's not just deterioration of those particular neurons. It's, it's deterioration of the neurons that control those neurons. And everything's working in a kind of a top-down suppression all the time. In fact, um, the head neurosurgeon at Neuralink, who's somebody I know quite well named Matthew McDougall, he came up through my laboratory, and Elon made a great choice in hiring him, um, told me recently, the best way to think about the frontal cortex is that basically its main job, besides picking context and strategy for a given situation, is to tell certain parts of your brain that really want to do things, shh. That's the best mm. description I have ever heard of prefrontal cortex. You know, it, it's what's keeping Jamie from doing things that he shouldn't right now and me doing things that I shouldn't right now. And every time you have a crazy idea, like, maybe I should jump off this bridge. Why would I think that? I'm not. That's a healthy operation of your brain saying, I want to because I'm kind of curious, but I don't want to. So I'm not going to. Right. With Huntington's, what happens is there's a slow deterioration of those neurons. But there's a lot of deterioration of these neurons that control motor function. And eventually what happens is the deeper neurons that control motor function start shutting down the autonomic functions like breathing, heart rate. And so eventually people just succumb to some basic, um, you know, uh, rec we call them housekeeping functions, you know, so mm. they'll, they'll have to be on a respirator and they, they have to, um, you know, they have to use a catheter tube and, you know, they have to defecate into a bag. And, you know, at some point they just become a, a, a deteriorated um, mess of neurons. So what's first to go there, however, is the, the control of motor function. And it goes first in the direction of too much activity because of all these brakes and accelerators that we have in the, in the brain. Um, so in any case, CRISPR, gene manipulation of the sort that this guy did in this laboratory in China, again, I think an ethics com committee needs to tell the world or decide for the world what people should be allowed to do and not do. But you can imagine for something like Huntington's, it would be tremendously advantageous. Like if you had a child who you knew was someday going to get Huntington's, you'd want to do it. CRISPR mutation and put the healthy gene back. Is there anything that's been shown to slow down the progress of Huntington's? Uh, there I'm not so versed. It's a little bit like MS, another neurodegenerative disease, multiple sclerosis, where certain things exacerbate it, like inflammation of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those things can be uh, almost random in, in some ways. Like some people who have uh, MS will eat a salad dressing with mustard in it, have a huge inflammatory response and have a flare-up, blurry vision and get worse, and then it returns to... Mustard. Not. Things like mustard. Is must mustard inflammatory? Well, must mustard isn't necessarily whole body inflammatory, but it if it's spicy mustard, it binds to what's called the substance P receptor or the, or the capsaicin receptor. We have receptors for anything that's kind of hot mm -hmm. and spicy, um, and those are the same receptors that respond to hot liquid. Uh, heat and, and spicy, obviously, very, very closely linked, and pain, all three of those very close. Whereas pain relief, very closely related to menthol and cool, not just the taste, but the actual physical sensation of cool. Mm. So heat, pain, and inflammation, kind of our cousins in this, in this sense, and cool, menthol, and lack of inflammation are also cousins in terms of receptors, neural circuits, this kind of thing. So can spicy food cause inflammation? Sure. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But I think one 